at the end of all of this, you still find yourself a memory theorist, right? You're still broadly Lockean in your conception of personal identity. Yeah, I, w- I would, I would, I would, I would, I now describe it as Lockean Bratman, Lock Bratman, because Lock gives you the picture of your connection with past person stages, your <laughs> that makes your present person stage a stage of the same person as them. And uh, uh, Bratman, with his concept of intention, really shows how you need something similar going into the future and uh, how crucial that is to our concept of a person. That is, uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot of of animals that have desires and beliefs of of some, uh, you know, and, and then that you could kind of say, well, yeah, they primitive animals have needs and perceptions and then it, then more complicated animals we could say oh, well they have something like beliefs and perceptions and they can have different beliefs about their surroundings depending on their perceptions and that will lead them to do different things so there's kind of something like the human will where uh, something like beliefs and something like desires get combined and determine action uh, but what you don't see, um, uh, I wouldn't say you don't see it in any non-human animals, but uh, it's not very obvious that it, it's the case in non-human animals, is this ability to um, uh, not, not to, to what we call uh, introspection and interoception. That is, uh, you not only are aware of you know presumably it's something like it's like something to be a bat or a dog or a cat uh but uh humans not only are aware of what's going on in their mind they can stop and think about it they can give names to various things going on in their mind or titles then they can think about where they came from uh and i think i saw connected with the difference between just being free and having free will. Uh, but um, uh, this, this gives them the ability to um, plan. Um, it's something I'm thinking about these days, so I won't give you the full finished theory because I don't have it yet. But Bratman says a lot of plausible things about it. So, so the idea is that re- we really have your, your present person stage uh, is connected to past person stages by a Lockean, Shoemakerian, memory-based relation, uh, and and your your it's it's connected to future person stages, which is a bit misleading because they don't exist yet. <laughs> But uh, they will, you know, and they will be formed as a result of uh, your present intentions and plans. And, you know, so, so forming an intention and planning is really a way of influencing what you're going to do in the future. But, but what comes with it is, is kind of a, 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 a commitment to certain values and things that's the way i'm looking at it but i haven't quite figured out but so i i think of it as the Locke bratman view of persons <laughs> um and I, I think that pleases bratman so and is it the lock bratman view of personal identity or of person so i, I like i i think you've answered a lot of this question that yeah. i already had but maybe we can make it more explicit but I, I guess I, I think of my cat here in my lap mm-hmm. and I want to say that she probably has some self, some sense of self, yeah. but at the same time, despite my love for this cat, I also don't want to say that she's a person right. yet. I wonder to what extent, I mean, is this just out of linguistic habit? Uh, because I also think of person as like a cognate of people. Or, mm-hmm. or synonymous yeah. with human. But how does this idea of personal identity 
uh, fit in with personhood so as to exclude uh, my cat from being a person? <laughs> well, okay, let's think about it. So, so first, we want to make sure we are distinguished between uh, unity relations and identity. Okay. So grab your cat's tail. I can uh, find it. I found it. Now, now grab her head. <laughs> no, with a different hand. Well, different yeah. hand. Yeah. Well, you can imagine doing it. Anyway, so, so, so now you've got you've got a cat with this head and a cat with this tail. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not it. What's the relation between the tail and the head? Well, they're not identical. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, you know, in a philosophical seminar, we might bring a box and a couple of cats to make the point that. You know, you can have a Frega problem, right? You can uh, you can be thinking about this cat, the one you're holding the head of, and this cat, the one you're holding the tail of, but not realize that <coughs> it's the same cat. Mm. But your cat's tail and your cat's head have, have a relation. They're connected by cat stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, a lot of it. And that means that the cat you refer to with the cat with his head and the cat you refer to with the cat with his tail are identical. Okay. And so the difference between different kinds of things uh, that have very different standards or criteria of identity is not different identity relations, according to me at least, but different unity relations. And what's, what personal identity theorists are disagreeing about uh, is the unity relation. Uh and um, in the unity relations, you know, there's a temporal unity relation and a physical, a spatial. Physical, right. <laughs> now, do we need to bring in? Do we need to bring in memory or anything like that to get it the the cat unity relation through time, or is it just? enough that their phases if we if we have a fairly rich concept of animal bodies through time mm-hmm. and if we've got the same cat body don't we have the same cat do we really need to worry about you know memory and intention well i don't know i suspect we don't need to but it might be useful for certain kinds of cases that philosophers can probably dream up involving, you know, cat brain transplants and maybe, you know, first first you create a super cat that has a lot more brain than the average cat. And I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but but being a person uh, involves well seems to involve being a human being. Well, what do we say about human beings that really don't have the brain power to do the ordinary things? Well, uh, most of the ones that have working brains at all uh, have memory and a certain amount of anticipation. I mean, autism, things like that. They don't don't lead to anything that would destroy (coughs) applications, unity relation for personal identity through time. But uh, um, we can imagine, and or or now take children. Children um, remember things. I think from day one, in some extended sense of re- remember, right? I mean, uh, a newborn will treat very quickly treat its mother different than other things. Um, but do they have a rich enough memory to really plug in this whole lock shoemaker idea? I don't know. But uh, so I, it may be that children aren't really persons yet. Uh, you know, Michael Tooley? I don't. Okay, well, <clears throat> he's a great philosopher. Uh, if there's a Nobel Prize in philosophy, he should get it, him or Dan Dennett. But. Uh, uh, where is he? Uh, Tooley's in Colorado now. He was at Stanford when I got here. Matter of fact, I think uh, uh, they were able to hire me because they decided to fire him, mm. which seemed to me at the time a terrible mistake. To yeah, fire what do you him. have to do to get fired from a philosophy department in the 
in in that time? Well, uh, at that time, the department didn't give tenure very often. I see. Uh, when I got here in 19, whatever it was, 73, I think the last person who'd been promoted from the ranks to get tenure was David Nibison. And that had been, I don't know, 15, 20 years before. In the meantime, they had uh, really not given tenure to some superb philosophers, including Michael Tooley, uh, but also uh, logicians specializing in probability, whose name I can't quite remember, but he went on to Princeton and was very famous. Um, and it, it was reason, the reason was because you had this, this colossal figure, Pat Soupies. You know Pat Soupies? So Pat Soupies was had come to the department and a tremendously brilliant person with a very powerful personality. And um, uh, so he just, you know, he didn't get enthused about people very easily. Mm. Uh, and then you had Julius Moravchik, who was much uh, more um, like a normal philosopher, but uh, didn't have as much influence as Pat. And then you had Stanford, which, like a lot of uh, universities, um, in my humble opinion, exploits the tenure system for a purpose that it wasn't created for. Uh, namely, the tenure system is supposed to give job security to people do a good job. You know, you come get some research done, you're a good teacher, you should get tenure. But Stanford, Harvard, a lot of those places, Yale, basically use it as an excuse to fire people who have done a good job, uh, uh, but somehow don't measure up or they think they can find somebody better. But I'm digressing anyway. Mm. But Tully then went to Australia and then um, ended up in Colorado. So uh, <laughs> the point was that Tully, this was way back or not too long after Roe versus Wade, so uh, abortion was uh, a topic that it is now. And Tooley wrote a good article and then a good book on abortion, I thought. And his main point was that um, uh, if, if we think, if, we, if we're bothered by abortion, we think we should, well, in other words, <laughs> how do I put this? Most people want to draw the line somewhere, as was done in Roe versus Wade, between having abortion, the point at which having abortion is a relatively trivial matter, does not involve anything approaching murder. You know, it's more like, uh, and then by the ninth, well, let's say by the time the kid is two years old, it's murder. Right. Now, somewhere in there, you have to draw a line and say, well, it doesn't have to be a very sharp line, but you have to explain, you know, it's like the bald paradox, right? So where, when does it become wrong? And when does it become so wrong that it's murder? Mm -hmm. uh, and Tully argued that if you really have a, a good definition of a, if you think it's not wrong until you have a person, uh, that it, it's perfectly reasonable to say, well, you really don't have a person until they're one or two years old. Can pass the mirror test. You know what the mirror test is? Yeah. Um, Recognizing themselves? Yeah. <laughs> now, I think Tooley had a very good point. I didn't agree with him that we should wait <laughs> until the kid is two years old before being upset by killing the kid. I actually thought Roe versus Wade, whatever its virtues as a piece of constitutional interpretation was a very reasonable approach to abortion. Uh, so what was my point? I forget what my point was. Anyway, so being a person isn't, if you have this view uh, about personal identity and so forth, it looks like certain kinds of brain accomplishments, mind accomplishments, intellectual abilities, uh, are connected with being the sort of thing that can stand with being the sort of episode that can stand in the unity relation to past and future episodes of 
personhood in the way that you should if you've got a single person. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, it's, um, it's kind of complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, I could go on and on about abortion, but for example, here's what you could do with season seven. Why is, why, why, why is abortion always been considered objectionable, at least by a lot of people? but not masturbation. I mean, sperm are alive. They're alive. They swim. They're definitely human. You know. Why are they definitely human? I mean, uh, well, one significant difference is, I mean, the zygote can become a human, but the a sperm by itself can't. Yeah, but that's not the explanation because long before they realized that, they, I mean, I basically mean the Catholic Church. <laughs> uh, when they thought that, kind of, since the sperm came from the male, it must be where the soul is. Well, they still didn't object to masturbation, even though there is a line in the Bible that says you shouldn't spill your seed on the ground. Hmm. So you can draw the line between a sperm and a zygote, but it's just, it's not, to me, not overwhelmingly right. odd that that's where you should draw the right. line. Uh, and I thought Roe Ro versus Wade did a pretty good job. But I think we're digressing from the main thing you wanted to explore and getting into things I have strong but not very scholarly opinions about. <laughs> you're you're welcome to explore those uh, yeah. opinions on the podcast yeah, anyway. as much as you like. And so I actually don't, I actually think uh, Tuli's uh, stuff on abortion uh, didn't help him in that in the 10 year battle at Stanford. Hmm. I, you know, it was over by the time I got here, so I can't really say, but sure. it's a, a, a kind of a, a defensive infanticide is not probably the best way yeah, to, get <laughs> to, to get tenure at a university uh, uh, whose biggest building is a church. Yeah. You've got to wait until you have tenure for that. <laughs> yeah. Right. So anyway, so anyway, that's how I think of personal identity. I don't claim to have it all figured out, but uh, yeah, I have, I don't I can't think of a view that I think is more plausible than mine. Um, but mine is very complicated, and maybe there should be a simpler theory of what a person is. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs>